If you enjoy Astronomy FM Radio, please let us know with a small donation. We do rely on your support, and it's true. Every little bit counts. AFM. You're listening to AFM Radio on Astronomy.FM, around the world and beyond. Arr. Coming up next, it's time for an AFM Radio original program, Space Pirate Radio, brought to you by the voice of astronomy, matey. This is Astronomy.FM. The pirates are coming. The pirates are coming. Arr. It's Space Pirate Radio times, everybody. Here on astronomy.fm radio. I didn't use buckos this time. Yeah, too bad. Get over it. Uh, it is 9 o'clock in the evening for those of us here in the eastern portion of North America, also known as, uh, uh, what time is it, Universal Time? 2 o'clock in the morning now, Universal Time, because we are over with Daylight Savings Time. So it is Eastern Standard Time, 9 o'clock in the evening, Wednesday, November the 8th. And the Universal Time is, of course, Thursday morning, November the 9th. So that means we're live, and of course, we have our Space Pirate um, what do we crew. Got open there? crew. Yeah, the chat yes. room open. Chat room. That's, that's the phrase I was going for, yes. So welcome, everybody. Glad to have you here. Let's say hi to everybody here. We've got me and you in there. We've got Aquafew, Glenn, Twist Edge, Richie, Plaid Mac, Doug at the Northern Cross Observatory, and Plaid Jones so far. So welcome aboard, everybody. Got any questions? Feel free to ask them in the chat room, and we'll try to answer them best we can right here on live radio or live for an entire hour. We had a little question um, about 12 hours ago, so let's try putting that uh, up for everybody to try to work out an answer to it. And that is the question is why is the sun, yeah, kind of written a little bit off, why is the sun? different in space than on the earth is kind of the way the quote why is the sun different in space than earth exact quote so let's try to take a guess at it maybe why does it appear different in space than it does from the earth something along those lines um kind of kind of interpret it so can't get a hold of the person that made this i'm thinking like Hmm, how does the sun look different from out in space compared to Earth? Well, one one feature is looking through atmosphere here on the Earth, and that will actually change the uh, the color of the sun from here on the ground. Yeah, so if you're looking through some atmosphere, that will definitely give a change. Now, either way, you can't look right at the sun. It's just too bright, so it's going to mostly be bright white, but uh, um, the sun starts to set in the evening, or if there's more dust in the atmosphere, the sun will tend to look a little bit more redder, the blue light gets scattered, so the sun can appear darker uh, with more atmosphere, so from the Earth, yeah, it could give you a little different appearance, and if it was just out in space, no atmosphere to look for, um, no reddening from particles, no bluing from the atmosphere, and it definitely would look a bit more whiter to your camera view. Again, either way, out in space or from the Earth, you can't look directly at there. So maybe mm-hmm. a little bit, little bit redder from here on the Earth for the atmospheric conditions. But I'd say that's be blue on Mars. Much, it'd be blue on Mars because of the dust particles and type of atmosphere. Yes, indeed. Oh, and we've got a couple more people in here. Black Projects, Evil Spock, Balrong. Glad to have you here, everybody. Oh, let's see. Where do we want to go? Want to go to the sun? I don't know why. There's nothing happening. I know, nothing happening as far as spots go, yes. Uh, A little bit of stuff coming off the sun, though. In fact, uh, wind speeds are are up pretty good at 557 kilometers per second. Particle density is still kind of low at uh, 3.38 protons per cubic centimeter. And that means, yes, there's some stuff shooting off the sun. So high-latitude observers should be looking for aurora tonight. Some spotted last night, uh, Alaska, some uh, northern countries, and should still get some tonight. In fact, some people, are, I think, are reporting some down in Wyoming. It's our Wyoming. Ooh. Yeah, so northern okay. United States was picking up a little bit of aurora. And we still got another good 12 hours of that, too. So get, an eye out, get, get some looks out there and see if we can see something. A little bit of activity, at least. Uh, we're going to pick uh, one object. We'll do it a little bit later, but I want to start picking an object um, to go object over. Du jour. Object du jour, yes. Yeah. So this week it's going to be 
Fomo Halt. Last week was a star uh, Regulus. Was it Regulus? No, it was uh, Deneb. Sorry. And tonight it'll be Fomo Halt. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, let's see, we had our Strongman Club meeting. Yes, we did. A couple nights ago, elected new officers. Yep. What else? Well, we had a fun talk on LIGO and gravitational oh, that's, waves. That's true. It's actually kind of cool the way that science has progressed so much in a terribly short window of time because we had a member um, who did a phenomenal talk on the futile and frustrating search for gravitational waves a few years ago. That's one of my favorite talks I've ever seen at the club. And then between that talk in maybe 2013 and now, LIGO, advanced LIGO came online, gravitational waves have been detected, and we've got a whole new realm of experimental science and observational science possible. Because relating to um, a lot of a lot of factors, dark matter, a lot of dark matter issues come up and stories come up too. So, well, let's see. Let me go over. Was I going to go over what's happened with the moon and planets lately? All right, coming up on uh, this Friday, we've got the last quarter moon. Finally, got rid of that uh, that full moon. Super moon, full moon, yeah. Yeah, getting in the way way too much. Uh, Saturday, we've got Regulus, 0.4 degrees south of the moon. There will be an occultation. I already figured this one out. It's going to be somewhere visible somewhere around Alaska. Oh, okay. So if you if you happen to live in Alaska, you can get a uh, maybe some aurora and an occultation of the moon covering Regulus. Sunday, Mercury going to be 2 degrees north of Antares. Um, next Monday, Venus will be three degrees north of Jupiter. Yeah, there's still Venus and Jupiter and Mars all hovering around the uh, around the sun lately. Wednesday, next Wednesday will be Mars with three degrees south of the moon. Hmm. So some planets out there, but everything's starting to definitely set early. We're getting some, you know, early nighttime skies for observers. More than happy to do that, but. Uh, solar observers not quite so happy. Especially <laughs> yeah. not in the northern hemisphere now. Yeah, and there's not much on the sun anyway, so yeah, look at the sun is just not so exciting right now. Saturn's kind of gone, just barely above the horizon after the sun goes down, so well, that's no good to look at. The, the uh, northern hemisphere summer triangle is still blazing way high overhead in the early part of the evening. Yep, looks it, real nice actually. Mm -hmm. And that's why I did pick uh, Deneb last time. And then our feature star to the south, after a little bit after the sun goes down, well, for us northern hemisphere observers, low to the south, almost on the meridian, is the star Fomalhalt, Pisces Australis. Southern fish. Yes, indeed. And, of course, uh, if you've been kind of following along on... Uh, uh, Discoveries around Fomalhaut made several years ago about about circles of disks going around, circumstellar disks, um, and planets. Yeah, it was one of the was it one of the third stars that had its distance accurately measured to have planetary disks. Yeah, around. and it was the first star with a planet candidate that was imaged at visible wavelengths. Uh huh. It's Fomalhaut. also the third brightest star, from our perspective at least, uh -huh. uh, to have a planetary system. Yep. Uh, let's see. Fomalhaut is uh, a little bit more than first magnitude. And constellation of Pisces Australis. Or Australis. Brightest, Australis, however you just pronounce it. Uh, Australis, either way. Southern fish. Southern fish, yes, indeed. Uh, just if you want to get technical, right ascension is 22 hours, 57 minutes, declination minus 27 degrees. But basically, uh, from where we're living at about 45 degrees north latitude, uh, it's kind of low on the southern horizon. If it wasn't so bright, most of us wouldn't even notice it. But it is bright, and it is fairly lonely. Um, mm -hmm. the, its name means the solitary one. It's also called the loneliest star. Because there's nothing else close to its latitude anywhere near that part of the sky. Oh, it's uh, it's bigger than the sun, actually. A little bit brighter than the sun. 
Uh, it's about twice the diameter of the sun and uh, a little bit hotter than the sun also, if I recall. And a couple other, well, there's a planet around it called, is it? Fomalhaut B. Fomalhaut B, and suspected a couple more planets around it also. Yep, probably. Mm-hmm. And with a, kind of a bit of a Kuiper Belt band around it also. Yes, which we have some cool pictures. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, it was imaged with the, the Hubble, actually. Thought to be kind of a kind of a newer star, somewhere around oh four hundred million years old, approximately, something like that. So definitely newer. Um, not it's going to be shorter lived. Yeah, it's of course. a baby compared to our sun. Yeah, but uh, it's a little bit hotter and a little bit brighter too. So it's not going to be uh, uh, sticking around as long as our sun, though. So it'll uh, cook off a little bit faster, but. Kind of an interesting star that it has that debris of dust and dirt all around it, and potentially going to be forming some planets. And when it, we talk about Fomalhaut, we're actually talking about the main star of triple star system. Yes. Because Fomalhaut B can mean two different things. There's an upper class B that refers to a companion star, mm-hmm. and there's the lower class B, lower case B that refers to the planet. So it's both. Yeah. So it's it's a complicated little system. Mm-hmm. But nice and easy to find, and uh, yeah, if you have a reasonable from the northern hemisphere, southern hem- southern hemisphere, pretty easy to pick out. So that's why we picked this one for tonight's special object. It's uh, pretty special. I really mm-hmm. enjoy seeing it in the autumn. Yeah, easy to pick out towards the south, especially when all the other major things are gone. Um when we usually look at towards the south, we've got uh, Antares is there. And this time of year, Saturn's been in in the uh, Scorpius Sagittarius region. So that's pretty much all set. And it's like it's like the next object that comes around, even though you don't really see the constellation. But you pick out that one single star, and it's quite prominent in the early part of the evening for Northern like, Hemisphere observers there. I like watching it rise over a really good flat horizon, like one of the Great Lakes. Mm-hmm. And... Um, it's hard to see the whole of the, it's, the constellation it's in because the rest of the stars are not very bright. But you do get the impression of um, whether, well, it's rather hard for me to see the fish part of the classical Pisces, the fishes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, with the constellation that Fomalhaut is in, I do feel it seems like a big, lurking, looming fish. I kind of like to think of it as an angler fish with a you know bioluminescent um, bait basically hanging in front of it. Now, me, it's always been kind of the opposite. I don't see the southern fish so much as I can see the two northern fish. Because the two northern fish, I can see circlets and they have strings that kind of you know go down to a point and then be back up and then it goes up to another circlet. But to me, Fomalt has always just been. We'll see the single star, and then, like, I assume all the stars that are sort of around it. Hmm. So, a little different for me. Yeah, I, I just, Pisces has always looked just kind of like a mess to me, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the stars Big definitely. sprawling thing. Yeah, the circlets are pretty faint with um, the uh, northern fish. But if you get out in the dark skies, I find it, well, because it's right underneath, um, uh, Pegasus, the great square of Pegasus. So I can mm. kind of I can kind of use that the great square to kind of see the outline of uh, Pis- the southern fish there. So uh, one one cir- one fish is like right underneath Pegasus, like the shoulder of uh, the horse itself, and then it dips down and then goes back up. So for me, it's a little easier, but everybody's got sees the constellations a little bit a little bit differently. We'll pick one. This one's good, I thought, because it's visible from northern and southern hemispheres. Yes, it is. In fact, the only place it's not visible is from extreme northern latitudes. Mm-hmm. At minus 29 degrees, you'd have to get up to uh, almost the Arctic Circle, I think. Yeah. Before it disappears. Yeah, about 60 degrees or something like that. And so. hey, we'll pick some more. We'll try it again. Again, we'll try to get either interesting objects or something kind of in between. Hmm. Andromeda Galaxy is coming up there, too. Actually, we got a question in the chat room. 
All right, let's go for the What's question. What's your favorite autumn object, Marty? Your favorite target? Hmm, my favorite target in the in the fall like this. Let's see. So again, we're kind of like coming off of the Sagittarius Scorpius region. Uh, we still got some band of Milky Way coming up through Cygnus, but that's a little bit a little bit low. But then we're also getting Cassiopeia Perseus and then Pegasus and Andromeda. Hmm, what would I say would be I will skip the I'll skip the ones that are rising like like Orion and Taurus. Yeah, I would go for the go for the stuff that's really obvious between like, I don't know, seven and midnight. Mm-hmm. I guess it would gonna have to be some of the globular clusters uh, around Pegasus to the Andromeda Galaxy and the Triangulum Galaxy. So some some of the fuzzy stuff that's out there. Triangulum's uh, amazing. Yep. yep. I like the double cluster in mm-hmm. Perseus. Mm-hmm. Um, Andromeda is eh, Andromeda is cool, but I, as impressive as it is, I, I wouldn't say it's my favorite. There is one object to the south that's awfully nice, Marty. The uh, Silver Coin Galaxy. Not familiar with that one. Oh, okay. It is beautiful. At least by it that is, name. Well, it's also called the Sculptor Galaxy. Sculptor Galaxy? That sounds really You may know it as NGC 253. It's got one of the easiest NGC designations to remember. Uh-huh. It's only three digits. Uh huh. If I recall, that is another very thin, needle like galaxy. Yeah, it's. Um, very edge on. It's edge on, but at least with uh, really good telescopes, like, say, Paranal Observatory in Chile, you can still see uh, the spiral makeup of it. Mm hmm. And it's just, it's really pretty. It's something, the last time I went looking for it, um, I was down in Hawaii, I think two years ago this week. And I walked out into the, there was a little sort of a pier there in Honolulu. And I walked out into the pier trying to get away from the hotel lights with my binoculars and went looking for it. So Mm -hmm. it's a nice object. Uh, I like this area because there's, well, there's a couple, there's like lots of everything this time of the year. Yes. Um, two globular clusters. Let's see, what's it? M2 and M15. M- M15, yes, off the nose of uh, Pegasus, the star Enif. So that kind of like points right to it. That makes it easy. M2 is kind of a nice globular cluster, but you still got some. Open clusters coming up through uh, the band of the Milky Way, um, right through Cygnus region there, and then then you know leading right on into some galaxies. So it's just kind of a generally good area. And right now the the, the two outer planets of Uranus and Neptune are right in that area too. So those are a little bit more of a challenge to find, um, but two planets that most people don't usually observe that much. And so. Uranus is still, <laughs> I was going to make a Uranus at opposition joke, but I just can't do it. Uranus is still looking pretty good. Marginally yeah. better than it normally does. Yep. It's still out there for definitely the all the early part of the evening and Neptune's ahead of it too. So I remember when, when Uranus passed Neptune some years ago, and uh, the separation between them is now kind of uh, it's kind of getting out there. And it's going to be quite a long time before Uranus goes all the way around the sky and catches up to Neptune again. Uh, good locator for Neptune is actually Fomalhaut again. So if you look to the northeast of Fomalhaut, you'll find uh, Neptune. And it's right by the star. What is it? What's that upside down Y? It's not Delta. Is that Lambda? What's the Greek gamma. letter? Gamma. Gamma. Okay. It's it's really close to Gamma Aquarius, known as 73 Aquarius, which is a pulsating variable star, by the way. So oh. it looks like it's, yeah. So that's kind of a decent marker for finding Neptune. Kind of, what's, what's that? Like a third magnitude star. Um High third, so almost fourth magnitude star, kind of out in the middle of it, nowhere-ish. So it's a pretty good indicator. So if you go from Lambda, Aquarius, and head south about half a degree or so, that's where you'll find Neptune. So in a pretty good spot to uh, to go find it since uh, Neptune's uh, yeah. a little and brighter. Yeah, you do than mean it. Lambda. Lambda looks like the upside down Y. Gamma looks like a, a lowercase gamma looks like a right side up Y. Okay. So you do mean Lambda. 
Okay, great. And Neptune's uh, about seven half, eight magnitude, something like that. So uh, definitely pretty easy to find, if you, especially if you go from Lambda Aquarius. And that would be, again, just uh, looks up, almost due north of Omaha. So that's my fun stuff for the uh, the evening. With a little bit of challenges, too. When you get out into some dark skies, there's some uh, uh, M33, the Triangulum Galaxy. There's some uh, gas clouds in Triangulum. It's a really bright mm. star formation region that actually stands out fairly well. One of the, yeah, uh, actually, kind of the knots in the arms. Yeah. So I did an experiment in, uh, I think it was May of last year. So we were observing from a friend's observatory in the Arizona mountains, 7,000 feet up. Mm -hmm. So we had a pair, especially fitted out pair of goggles with an um, uh, oxygen three filter in the okay. goggles. Uh -huh. So we were trying to see those knots of star forming um, naked eye. Ah. You know, at, at no magnification, just with the goggles. Mm -hmm. It didn't work, but even on a mountain, conditions were a little bit subpar. They were having uncommonly bad weather. Okay. So, I'm going to try it again. Okay. Yeah, it's tough. You have to really, yeah, definitely have to have some really super dark skies. Uh, M33 is visible naked eye. Fuzzy spot more so, I sorry, less so than uh, M31, the Andromeda Galaxy. And I've definitely seen the knots through some decent sized telescope, but being able to pick out a blob like that, hmm, that'd be a challenge. Naked eye. Yeah. Well, that was part of the point. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're astronomers. We, we pick uh, kind of ridiculous self goals and we try to meet them. Mm -hmm. So, nothing for the sun, except a little bit of rural activity coming up and then uh, a little bit of planets and occultations or star occultations coming up too oh yeah let's kind of let's might as well continue on to like let me go into the morning skies like really close yes. uh the planets nice there the morning. yes um towards the east got venus and jupiter are really close Mars is getting a little higher. That means Mars is basically coming around again. Uh, so we got to get ready for our uh, closest approach again. And that's probably going to be about another nine months or something like that, I'm taking a guess. Mm -hmm. So, and definitely going to be a little bit of a, uh, I'd say, a higher one than the past one. That was like in Sagittarius, I think it was, last time. That's too low for us. Yeah, we're going to have a really nice opposition of Mars in summer of next year. Mm -hmm. Nicest one we've had in a while. Yeah. The problem with oppositions, though, when it's in higher constellations along the ecliptic, mm -hmm. is that it is uh, tends to be a little bit farther away from us than a, a close one, mm. than a low one. Oh, I just kind of zapped up, and oh, it's actually not much better. Oh, it looked like it was going to be promising, and I just zapped up to uh, to June. And it looks like, oh, it's not in Sagittarius, but it is in Capricorn, the next constellation over. And again, Capricorn is fairly far south again. So, well, that's kind of unusual to stick around that close to at oppositions. So, hmm, we just got it out of Sagittarius, and now it's going to be in Capricorn. Again, a low southern towards the horizon for us in the northern hemisphere opposition so that always makes it a little bit blurrier it can be a little bit closer for an opposition but more atmosphere to look look through makes it a lot less interesting that way oh where am i coming up here i'm just going across something here mm. discovering oh mars and saturn are going to have a really nice conjunction oh, let me cool. I just play with my star chart on Looks like right around April the 2nd, Mars and Saturn really close to each other. And let's see what time. This is about 4 in the morning, so it should have no problem after that. 5, 6 in the morning. Oh, due, almost due south. Oh, It's going to look really nice. We're going to have the moon. We're going to have Jupiter. And then we're going to have Mars and Saturn really close to them, really close to each other. So really nice conjunction 
coming up in April of Mars and Saturn. So Mars is actually getting getting farther away from the sun right now. And uh, we're kind of just past Venus. A lot of nice conjunctions. Uh, we also have an apparition of Mercury coming up. Do we? That must yeah, be the 23rd. A, must be towards the west, I'm thinking. Is it or is it in the morning sky? I believe it's an evening one this time around. All right, let me go. Let me go zap up my around the twenty third. We've got on our official, our official calendar anyway. All right, so let me go and uh, move the sun towards uh, the horizon, and see if I can find Mercury over there, Saturn, and Mercury. All right, Saturn and Mercury coming up, uh, kind of close to each other, but looks like it's going to be right around uh, sunset. Just a little bit before sunset. That should be real nice. Yeah, so that'd be nice. Again, doing some uh, daytime observations might be a little easier. Well, they're, uh, they're they're quite a ways off on the ecliptic. It looks like a good five degrees or something. Like that. Must be closer than that. But they're actually this conjunction of Saturn and Mercury is not very close together. So their their declinations are quite a bit. Let's see if I can get the declination for Mercury at this time. It would be. Uh, minus 25 degrees and Saturn is minus 22 degrees so 3 degrees separation between um, Mercury and Saturn on the 23rd of November that's that's quite a ways actually so I wonder gee, which one which one's farther off of the ecliptic I don't think I've got an ecliptic line. It would take me a little while to find the ecliptic line. And see, But I would say it's probably Mercury that's farther off the ecliptic. Mm, okay. Another one. But we'll see. It's, can't do any observing outside. It's always fun to do it on a star chart <laughs> computer. <laughs> totally uh, not my way of doing any type of observing, uh, computer observing. I just think, phew, to that, yeah. Now, I don't mind. Oh, let's see if we can find something just before our halfway point here. Coming up on Saturday, November the 11th, about 7.30 in the morning. This is Eastern Daylight Time. Hmm, I think they're a little bit off. Launch of the orbital ATK cargo resupply mission to the space station. Nice. I, I think it's not... EDT, it's probably EST, Eastern Standard Time. I'm going to take a chance at that one. We are, we are off. off daylight savings time, yes. Yeah, that's why our local sunset is a little bit after 5 o'clock in the evening right now. And we still have uh, ooh, more than a month ago to uh, the uh, December solstice. Yes. Longest nights. We still got a ways. So, yeah, it's going to be... It's getting to be that long, wintry, astronomers love it, time of year again. <laughs> Cold fronts, yeah, clear well, this, skies. This month, November, is not so bad for us because it gets down to only about 30-ish or so, maybe a little bit colder, but not that much colder. Um, mm -hmm. so it's not that blistering 10 degrees below with a couple feet of snow on the ground. So this observing time right now is good for us because you can get out there early, like get home. You can even during, during a work week, get home, eat some dinner, get out by six or seven. If you're observing sites, not too far away, observe till nine, 10, even 11 o'clock in the evening, pack your stuff up, get back home and get into bed at a reasonable time to go back to work. The next morning so it's not so bad don't nice. have all that snow yeah. on the ground or snow on the roads so it's not too bad of an observing time of year uh just a matter of you know picking that time like about now when you start getting rid of the moon getting on the last quarter and it's going to be even better for that so yeah anytime within the next couple of weeks for northern hemisphere observers when it's, it's dark early and the skies are the skies can be clear and not too too cold yet all right, let's, uh, let's yeah, in fact, uh, Doug in our chat room says he's already run about two and a half hours of ready of uh, observing cool. tonight. So, yeah. Helps when you could just walk out in your background, in your backyard, too. 
<laughs> All right, let's do our little station identification, which means you are say Arr. Arr. listening to Space Arr. Pirate Radio. Arr. Listen to Space Pirate Radio here on Astronomy.fm Radio. It is another Wednesday evening, and this one happens to be November the 8th, 2017, Wednesday evening for us at about 9.30 in the evening, uh, also known uh, Universal Time, no more Daylight Savings Time, so uh, Universal Time that would put it at 2 o'clock in the morning, November the 9th, 2017, Universal Time. So that means you're listening to us live, and we've got about another half hour of live programming. And don't forget, we've got more programming coming up after Space Pirate Radio. We should have the usual uh, Astronomy Ireland, Planetary Radio, Naked Astronomy, Naked Scientist, all coming up after Space Pirate Radio. And don't forget our But chat- we also have special programming. Do we have special programming tonight? We have a Comet Watch. What do we have? Carl Sagan Day. Ah, oh, that's Carl right. Carl Sagan Day. That's tomorrow. For Carl Sagan's birthday, we will be doing, yes, tomorrow, we will be doing special programming. All right. Glenn says, pass me a cup of grog. I agree. Grog and hot chocolate for evening observing right now. Yeah, that sounds good. But grog and observing don't really mix. That's more of a cloud weather astronomer thing. Well, yeah. Well, technically, grog is more like water down water. (laughs) <laughs> so you shouldn't drink too much of it and it won't affect you too won't affect you and your brewing too bad so one cup not, won't make you go cross-eyed that's true yes and you'll be sleepy right about the time you get home no just enough to take the edge off while you're out observing so easy, easy enough that way Oh, let's see what else is going on with NASA. Let's see. Uh, NASA completes their review of the first SLS Orion deep space exploration mission. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Let me pop that article into our uh, chat room here for further reading. And don't forget, we'll we'll pop these articles into our uh, uh, Facebook page, the Stromy.fm Facebook page, and our Space Pirate Radio Facebook page, too. So you can go back over those articles and do a little bit more in-depth reading. So getting ready for that next launch system. When it's going to go, who knows? But at least there's, there's still... a lot moving. of factors. Yeah, a lot of factors in the way, but they are still moving forward with it. Mm-hmm. Um, hey, I got a different sort of NASA story. It's been um, a while okay. since we talked about vintage astronauts, but we did have another of the Apollo-era astronauts pass away. Yes. Richard a.k.a. Dick Gordon from Mm -hmm. Apollo 12, Mm -hmm. uh, died on Monday, November 6th at his home in California. And he was a a naval aviator. He was the command module pilot on Apollo 12, which was an all-Navy team, which was uh, kind of unusual. For instance, Apollo 11 was uh, Navy and Air Force guys, and Apollo 15 was all Air Force guys. But Apollo 12 was uh, all naval aviators. And he um, was on a kind of the quieter guy in a very colorful crew with uh, Pete Conrad was the commander and Alan Bean, who of course has a, uh, in addition to doing, you know, public events, he's, he's a painter now was the lunar module pilot. And Dick uh, was the quieter guy who stayed up there and kept everything running while they uh, had fun down on the moon. Mm -hmm. Uh, He did have an interesting post NASA career as a, a football executive. He uh, was an executive for the New Orleans Saints for a time. Oh, wow. Yeah. And he did a lot of philanthropic work. So, you know, very, very distinguished life and career. And another of the, you know, great moonshot air astronauts that uh, is gone. Mm-hmm. Dick Gordon. Dick yeah, Gordon. There was an article on why it's not so bad to not go down to the surface to the moon, but to stay back is because you actually get to see more of the moon. This is true. Yeah, you get make you get to make multiple orbits um, around the moon while the the landing crew is down on the surface, which only gets to see that immediate area. So you get to see a whole bunch of a lot more lunar landscape multiple times, staying back in the uh, yeah. Command capsule. 
So that's one advantage to it, if that helps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm sure there was also always a little bit of a um, consolation prize aspect to the mm-hmm. guys who were the command module pilots. So actually, I, I always mentioned that Conrad and Bean, his crewmates, did they were did practical jokes. One of the practical jokes that they were intending to do was to have their camera set up with a timer. And this is child's play these days, but we're talking something that happened in 1970. They were, or end of 1969. They're, they wanted to do a timed photograph of the two of them posing together on the moon so that everybody would wonder, well, who took the picture? <laughs> And I think Conrad misplaced the timer, so they never did it. But flash forward decades later, when Alan Bean is doing his paintings, he's got a really touching painting. And it's of three astronauts in Apollo spacesuits on the moon. And so, the you know, it, you know, representing what could have been if he and Conrad and Gordon had all been up there together. Mm -hmm. That was was really sweet. You know, going to circle around the moon, you got to admit is, is better than not going to circle around the moon. Totally. Staying back. Yes. Totally. Mm -hmm. Like none of the current astronauts have an opportunity to orbit the moon and get a close up look at it. Yeah, unless we get that SLS rocket up and running. That would be nice. They're shooting for uh, 2019, 2020, somewhere around there. So we'll see how how the uh, the testing goes. And if they stay successful, they can do that. Or have some minor glitches that they fix, which is always a good thing, too. Good to find a, a things on shakedown tests. Get another launch coming up, uh, just a... a NOAA rocket, a weather rocket coming up on um, Tuesday the 14th also. So I wonder, if, wonder if that, where that one's going to launch from. It doesn't say. Usually that might be wallops, but I have no idea. I'll click on it and, and see. Off uh, Virginia? Yeah. Yeah, me... they'd be wallops. Okay. Most likely. Mm-hmm. So there's uh, the New Horizons mission is heading to its next flyby target. Mm-hmm. And they're offering a, I don't know if it's a contest or just opinion poll or what, but they're now accepting suggestions for names of this object, astronomy.fm. So if anybody has an idea of what they might, might want to call it, astronomy.fm, is my subliminal messaging working? <laughs> yes. submit, submit your ideas to... Uh, to NASA, go look on the NASA webpage, and uh, we'll see how they they pick it. If they're going to just do, uh, you know, popular choice, which means the most people that pick a certain name, or will they do it randomly, or will they just look at all the suggestions and have a committee vote on the one that sounds the best, astronomy.fm, and uh, and see how it goes. So yeah, just right now it just has a designation of 2014 MU69. Isn't that interesting? Oh, plus in parentheses. 486958. That's that's mm. the name it goes by now. So. It needs Not a very, catchier name. It needs a catchy name, yes. So what could it what could it possibly astronomy.fm? So send your submissions into NASA <laughs> and see what come up. Now I did think and I was thinking of but well, maybe it's a little too too commercial of icy. It sounds like a slurpy drink. Mmm. Not really slurpy weather, but yum. Mm, no, slurpy with Rum, that would that okay. Would work. That would work. It's that's be the fine. Name. I think that's going to be the name of our show tonight: Slurpy with Rum. An icy with rum. <laughs> how about icy that? with rum, as long as they don't sue us. Yeah. Well, it depends on how we spell it. Oh, so anyways, check that out. If you got some ideas, they have to be sent in to by three o'clock, uh, December the first. And then let's see, the New Horizon team will review the top vote getters and announce their selection in early January. So get your suggestions in there, Starling out of him. And uh, you never know what they'll pick. Maybe they'll pick something that you pick. Check that out. The Juno mission is still going around Jupiter. And, and? And, well, we've got a little story in a zombie star. Really? Oh, cool. 
Okay, so we all we all know the conventional wisdom about supernovae, right? Mm-hmm. Star goes boom, dies. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, we've got a star. It has the name IPTF fourteen HLS. It was discovered in twenty fourteen by the Palomar Transient Factory, which is an automated wide field survey looking for things that vary over time. Mm-hmm. And things that vary in brightness over time can be variable stars. They can be transient objects. They can be supernovae. Mm-hmm. Well, this one, when first spotted, uh, it looked like it was just a, a regular old type one, type two piece supernova. Mm-hmm. Except after it faded out, it got brighter again. Mm-hmm. And over the course of three years, it fluctuated five separate times. So this scientist said, all right, this is not a typical supernova. They went looking through their archival data. Mm -hmm. Back in 1954, there was another explosion in the same exact location as IPTF 14 HLS. So somehow this thing survived a supernova back in 19, back in however long it took for us to see it in 1954. Mm -hmm. So, how does something go supernova twice? And it looks like it's got a little different spectral type, too. So, it's like, it's definitely not your standard supernova. Right. So, it's like... They compared it to finding a, a dinosaur, and I don't mean a bird. I mean a classic textbook stegosaurus or tyrannosaurus wandering around today mm-hmm. like if you see something like that you know what would you think you know, um, can't actually be a stegosaurus they've been extinct for a really long time mm-hmm. so it's possible that this was a star so massive and hot that it generated antimatter in its core mm-hmm. and went unstable those objects like that presumably exist in the early universe and really shouldn't exist today. Mm-hmm. So that would make it a dinosaur. That would make it a stegosaurus wandering around right now mm-hmm. or a trilobite or go back to the Precambrian. Like this should not be happening. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to think they're going to be monitoring this thing for a while to come to figure out what is going on with it. Yep. Now this is in a galaxy that's pretty far away. I'm trying to find the distance to the galaxy. So it doesn't look like a really big, close galaxy. It's like the galaxy is pretty far away and pretty small. So is it also possible it's not actually the same star? Because in the image that I've got up here, it's like it's the galaxy is like a small little fuzzy blob. And this is a lump off to one side. So hmm, can you really... Can they really pinpoint that this is the exact same object? It looks in a similar area, but is that more of a coincidence? Is it the well, exact same that, star? That's an interesting question. That's a, a real Occam's razor, razor kind of. <laughs> it's not the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to find the distance. I that. don't. I've not seen that floated though. Okay. So that that doesn't seem to be seriously considered at present. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to find the distance to this galaxy. It doesn't say it in the article that I have. Is it in the article that you have by any chance? No, it is not. Okay. Let's uh let's go to the art let's go to the scientific paper in nature. Oh, okay, there you go. Uh I put a link in our chat room. This it is from uh SciTech Daily, by the way, if you want to uh, look at that article. And uh, just looking at the galaxy, yeah, it looks like it's pretty far away. Yeah, this it is, is behind pretty, a paywall. Pretty small and pretty undefined yeah. image of the galaxy. So, so. But, like I said, they, they are finding uh, that this explosion is different. They're getting different spectra out of it than a standard uh, supernova. And the way this one exploded by itself, you know, it, brighter, dimmer, brighter, dimmer type of thing, uh, it's not the way... Even if it's not a 50-year separation, it's just not the way that a supernova explodes. No. Uh, you know, they, they'll fade away after a few weeks. This one's lasting months to years, that up and down. 
Definitely. Hey, you mentioned you mentioned uh, sort of early galaxies. So in, another odd thing that's been discovered is the oldest spiral galaxy in the universe. Ah, uh, okay. Which is pretty impressive because true spiral galaxies dated back to the early universe are not common. Mm-hmm. So we've got one uh, confirmed to be 11 billion years old. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, their spiral galaxies were very small way back then, and they thought they were thought to to have grown by basically devouring other galaxies and smaller galaxies and dwarf galaxies and just kept building up and building up and building up like that. So um, kind of hard to find a, a normal-sized spirally galaxy that old. I think this, was, this one was discovered and dated by gravitational lensing, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, they combined gravitational lensing with uh, an infrared. Um, it's called the Integral Field Spectrograph, which is on the Gemini North in Hawaii. Okay. So they have to... Now, was this with a supernova also that did it? The discovery yeah. on this one? No, was it, you know, galaxy, Not gravitation? That I saw, but I didn't go back to read the original abstract. Okay. Gravitational lensing, yeah. Gravitational lensing. I wonder if it took... Well, it could take generally a couple of things, either a maybe a variable star or a or a supernova with gravitational lensing, unless it was just gravitationally lensed enough to actually get spectra from the galaxy and determine how far away it is by its by its light shift, redshift, and speed. So otherwise, yeah, was maybe it was just uh, the redshift of the galaxy. Um, which actually would have been too dim to to see, to get the spectra on it, to get the redshift. It wasn't gravitationally lensed, which made it brighter and bright enough to actually get the spectrographic data off of it to find out that you know it's moving really fast. So it means mm-hmm. it's really far away. But something that small and that far away, they wouldn't actually been able to pick up uh, the redshift off of it. That's by thinking and probability and how it was uh, discovered. So we got a new record. Yeah, so it's got some unusual. It's got some unusual features. Um, it's at the moment that we've got it captured, basically, it's forming stars ten to twenty times faster than galaxies today, mm-hmm. which is normal That's enough. Normal. Yeah, for galaxies of that vintage. But unlike other galaxies that go back eleven billion years. It has a cool and thin disk that's rotating calmly without a lot of turbulence, which that's not something you've seen before. Mm-hmm. Again, probably because they're all fairly small. And uh, the, well, the ones that we do see way back then are basically something that's very active, very disrupted by a lot of star formation and mm-hmm. stars exploding and the black holes gobbling up stuff, squished and tugged. As it goes around the planet, so basically, what do they call it? Tidal stretching? Tidal, what's that other word I'm looking for? Well, basically, yeah, the gravity is just kind of keeping stuff, you know, moving. Tidal shearing. Tidal shearing, you know, Thanks, something Bob. else. Mm-hmm. Inside of it, so that would keep it, uh, you know, flexing and, and keep it liquid inside there. So that's what they're they're thinking. I didn't know it was like the brightest moon in the solar system, one of the brightest, because it's almost 100% it's water ice. covered. Yeah, it's, it's ice shiny. covered. Yep. As opposed to our moon, which is volcanic rock, and it's like a color of asphalt, really. Yeah, basalt. Basaltic lava. Yep. A uh, very a multi-layered observing question in the chat room that I honestly don't know the answer to, and I'm, I'll see if you do, Marty. Okay, doke. What is the most distant... Globular cluster visible in the northern hemisphere with an amateur telescope. Hmm. And I think we might need a asterisk on what amateur telescope means because I know a guy with a thirty-six inch. Mm-hmm. And that's well, not fair. <laughs> yeah, but we could go visually on that. Uh, let's say if we want to get down to ten, twelve, eight, something like that. 
Hmm, there are globulars in the Andromeda galaxy, two plus million light years away. I'm trying to think, are there some the in the northern hemisphere? Yep, I think, are there some in M33? Triangulum galaxy that we talked about but earlier. Would you consider those to be within the reach of an amateur telescope? M33 for sure, yeah. Yeah, 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 M33, but are you picking out globular clusters with your eyes? Hmm. I don't know. I'd have to look that one up and see. I, th I think there's definitely globular clusters that can be seen in amateur scope in the Andromeda galaxy. Okay, so we've got uh, around the Milky Way itself, we've got 157 globular clusters. Okay. Um, I'm thinking that probably the a candidate might be on the Palomar list. So there's 15 Palomar globular clusters. Some of them are actually visible in an 8-inch telescope. S some of them need a 16-inch. I would still consider a 16-inch. I would consider... Yeah, an 18-inch to be probably the reasonable upper limit for your standard, privately owned, within the reach of your fairly typical amateur astronomer telescope. That's the size of my Dobsonian. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, we, we, we have a number of colleagues who have had, say, you know, an 18-inch obsession or something like that. So I would say 18-inch is like, okay, I, I would consider that an amateur telescope. Mm -hmm. So there's some things in the, the Palomar list, and from the name Palomar, you might think, yeah, they had to take out a pretty big gun to find this. They're not bright. They're certainly nothing like Messier objects. Um, one of them, potentially, I mean, we've got some in, let's see, Pegasus, Hercules, definite northern hemisphere objects. So just have to maybe get a bead on how far away each one of these are and you might have a candidate for the most distant northern hemisphere globular cluster visible in an amateur scope mm -hmm. here's a little article on some of the globulars in m33 that i just found the quickest quickest one because that's the one i'm thinking of if those uh, are visible in amateur scope they win <laughs> hands down yeah uh I have to see if it says the uh, the magnitude of them. So hmm, it looks like they might be, but I have to read the article a little bit more. So they're they're pointing out like four different globulars in M33: uh, C27, C39, U49, and U62, the designated uh, globulars in there. So not much detail in this article, but there's a finder chart for them. So I'm thinking most likely M33 was at about 3.3 million miles away, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Edges yeah. out the Andromeda. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say the magnitude of these. I have to, have to look them up separately, but that would be my best guess. Like I say, I know I've seen the star form formation regions in uh, M33. So I'm thinking it's possible to see those globulars, but I'll have to look up the magnitude of them and, and see what they say. If I can find that somewhere. Or people out there, look it up real quick because we only got about four more minutes left. Good one to try. Let's see what else we got. We got still got images from uh, Juno circling around Jupiter, which is kind of basically behind the sun right now and just barely starting to come up. So it's going to be a while before we get any Jupiter images. So we're kind of in a little lull of bright planets now. Saturn's just disappearing. Um, Jupiter's too far around the sun. They're all around the sun lately. So only faint planets now. So it's going to be a while before we get back to planets again. So regular observing for the fun of it. <laughs> now a little interesting article from the NASA webpage on uh, uh, they're doing a lot more studies about Antarctica. Oh. Yeah, and what's under like some of the ice shelves and, and why there's some uh, why some of the, the things are there. They said, well, there's, they think there's like a little bit of a heat dome under the Marie Bird land dome. That's what it's called. Uh, geothermal heat source, kind of like a mantle plume, they think is lying underneath that. And it could explain some of the melting that they're 
they're getting there. They're discovering some lakes and rivers underneath the ice sheet. And they think, at least in this part of it, there might be a, a little bit of a hot spot. Cool. Just, you got a link for that? Uh, yep. Let me put it into a, uh, our chat room here. Slow computer, but okay, here it comes. Yeah, not ways of detecting it. Not as definitely as hot as Yellowstone. Um, but then, but then a little warmer than. <laughs> it's pretty hot. Yeah, yeah, definitely that. Yeah, that spot's up pretty hot. Um, here we go. Okay, so yeah, at least so there's um, definitely a hot spot under there. Probably using different methods of looking for it, which is causing some some little bit of melting under the ice, and they th think they see the the dome kind of moving up and down. Let's, let's see. Oh, so the average average uh, you know heat temperature of the Earth what 140 60 milliwatts. Um, is this one uh, the one that's coming from uh, an article is about 150 milliwatts, and Yellowstone's about 200 millil milliwatts. So All per, right. Per square meter, so it gives you an idea. And I think that's got to be our last one tonight, Marty. I think so, too. It is. So we're going to thank everybody in our chat room for uh, visiting us tonight. Really appreciate you being here and being part of our crew. And, of course, everybody listening in, don't forget we've got more programming coming up right after Space Pirate Radio, including Astronomy Ireland. We have three more hours, so we have a four-hour block repeated every four hours for the next 24 hours. So appreciate you listening in. Keep listening in. And uh, thanks, everybody, that's been in our chat room tonight. Good night, everybody. Good night, y'all. Clear skies. We hope that you've enjoyed this program from AFM Radio, the broadcast service of Astronomy.fm. This program has been released under Creative Commons license. Please contact us for details. You may find more of our AFM original programs on our website. It's really easy to find us. We are Astronomy.fm. You may also find us in the iTunes radio listings near the top of the News Talk section and also as an iTunes podcast selection. We'd love to hear your comments. Please email us at radio at Astronomy.fm. Thanks so much for being part of the Voice of Astronomy around the world, and across the known universe. This is Astronomy.fm Radio. AFM.